Hey, guys, see that girl? Oh. Somebody really ought to help her. Yeah, and that someone should probably be us. Yeah, Feet's right. You know, we're here, there's a need, let's go help her. Of course we should. I was just testing you guys. Now just relax, I've got this. I can call upon my vast wisdom and knowledge to figure out the best course of action to help save this girl's life. Just give me a moment. A moment? She might not have a moment. She might not even have a second. She could go into shock. Well, you think you're going over there too? Um, what do you know about children or shock or traumatic brain injury? Come on, brain. I think you're overthinking this a little bit, you know? Hands, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Now, as I was saying, I'm the perfect candidate to help this child. I saw that, guys. Now, just sit back, relax, and watch me work my magic. <laughs> oh, you forgot again, didn't you, Brain? You can't move without me. Darn it. You're right. I guess I'm going to need your help after all, Feet. So now, if you will so kindly take me over there. <clears throat> Hands? Mm-hmm. I think I forgot something. Yeah, yeah, I think you did too. You, you think you forgot something? When are you going to remember that you can't really do anything without us helping you out? I'm you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. I'm sorry. I guess I just had a brain fart. Anyway, there's still no time to waste. Her life still could be hanging in the balance. We need to get over there now. Okay. High five! <laughs> oh man, we really made a difference, didn't we? That was great. Yes, it sure felt good. But I have to apologize, hands and feet. I tend to get a little cocky sometimes. I forget that we do our best work when we're working together. Now, just imagine what we could accomplish when we invite Mouth to join us. Good point. Lights out, lights out. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And that skit will make a little more sense. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12. And I invite you to stand for the reading of the word. The Apostle Paul's words to the church in Corinth. He writes, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body, 
by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would it be if it had only one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for um, calling us, equipping us, and using us to make a difference in the world. I just pray that we would be inspired and, uh, and motivated to join with you in this great mission you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's a, it's a great analogy Paul came up with under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, obviously, talking about the human body. Did you know there are 79 different organs in the human body? Guess how many are vital? You know what that means. You can't survive without them. How many? If Grant were here, he would know. There are five vital organs, five organs without which or without the function of these, you're dead. You know what they are? No, not gallbladder. All right. I'll help you out. So we got this guy, the brain. The heart, then they get harder. The lungs, good. Kidneys, Kidneys and liver. Why, well, you can't. She, she's a nurse. All right. Now I got to animate the kidneys. Okay. So that's all you need, right, to flourish in life, your five vital organs. We can live without the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the pancreas, um, the skin can somehow survive, but not very well. Are you picking up what I'm trying to lay down? So what is vital to being the church? Well, we've been talking about that. That's kind of what this series is about. We believe it's vital that we live in community as believers, that we you know, encourage each other and bear each other's burdens and spur one another to love and good deeds. That, you know, we need each other to be the church. And, and loving God, greatest commandment, heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it's also vital that we partner with God in ministering to those inside the church and outside the church, that we become the hands and feet of Jesus. So, you know, to do those vital functions requires small group leaders, hospitality people, Glenda Berg, right? You remember Glenda? Well, some of you might not. If you've come in the last year or so. The Bergs moved a year ago. Glenda ain't coming back, right? She left these huge shoes to fill because she knew everyone and knew all your stories and you know, it might take three of you to be one Glenda, but I'm still waiting for those three people. She's not coming back. But we need 
people that help us with community and connection with each other. It's vital. We, we need help people to help us in our you know, vertical relationship with, with God, with Jesus, through worship and prayer and Bible study, right? These are vital people in our church. And the serving arm, the, the HR, mobilizing people to serve and missions efforts outside the walls. You agree with me? You tracking with me? These are vital people. But what about our building and grounds people? Or our tech people, or children and teen workers, finance people, prayers, and, and the list goes on. Which of these can we live without as a church? And if we live without them, how, how healthy are we going to be? How effective are we going to be in our mission? And we're just talking about, that was just what we're doing in the walls, our, our weekly ministries. And we got a way bigger goal than that. We are to reach everyone. You know, that's our great mission, according to Jesus in Matthew 28, to, you know, reach and teach, to help people learn to know and love Jesus Christ outside these walls. And, and that's his important part, maybe more important how are we going to do that with 20% participation? And I go so, so far as to say this is your first blank, if you're following along. There is someone you are supposed to reach, to love, to serve, to influence for Christ. You, where you live, in your sphere of influence. And if you don't do it, maybe no one will. And, and you know, they'll miss heaven. That's where we're, he you know, people are headed for eternal separation from God unless something changes. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but, but that is our default unless something changes. And, and that's where you and I come into play. I don't know if you live with that sense of urgency, but I do. And I don't really know exactly who that is. I I've written some names on our prayer mural over here, and I pray for them every day. But I'll run into people about, you know, once, twice a week and say, man, maybe that person is someone I can help, you know, lead to Jesus through, through loving and serving and eventually telling them about Jesus. And that's not just for preachers. We're all called to be witnesses. I don't think we take that seriously enough. I mean, there are people who probably won't make it, who won't be ready when their last breath comes if you don't get involved. God's plan, you know, he's not willing that any perish, but his plan is for the entire body, the church, working together to build Christ's kingdom. Now, you can build your family, you can build your business, you can build your retirement account, but this is why we're here, to build the kingdom of God, to help, you know, as Pastor James used to say, depopulate hell. <laughs> Amen? It's our, it's our mission. This is what God is calling us to to live in community, to share life, to encourage each other to love him and grow in that love so that we can live out the mission that we've all been called to. You are needed. I think that's what I'm trying to say. You're needed. If you don't get involved, something vital in our church and beyond won't get done. Someone once said that we can't, or done what we can't, I'm sorry, without God, we can't accomplish probably anything lasting, anything life-changing, right? I mean, without the Spirit of God living in us, flowing through us, we're limited. We admit that. Like, we, he's the power source. Without God, we can't, but without us, God won't. We see that all through Scripture, 
when God wanted to cut a giant down to size, he raised up a shepherd boy. Someone had to fling that rock. When God wanted to defeat the prophets of Baal and remind his people who is the Lord, he raised up a man named Elijah. When Jesus wanted to feed 5,000 hungry people plus women and children, he needed a boy with a small lunch. I reference this in, in my prayer. You know, God's heart was to help his people, the Israelites, return to him. And, and he needed, needed someone to courageously and boldly tell the truth. He said, who will go for us? Who will be my spokesman? And, and nothing was going to happen until Isaiah said, hey, <laughs> I'm available. I'm willing. <laughs> Use me. God isn't just looking for preachers and prophets. He's looking for ordinary Christians to do extraordinary things for him. You are needed. You are gifted. The Bible says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. We believe when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, when we are saved... Somehow, you know, God does something supernatural in us so that we can do things for others. We call them spiritual gifts. Every believer has at least one. You've heard that before. Most probably have more than one. I heard a sermon um, at the, way, the Awakening last year prayer conference, some of you plan to go with. We, we still have a sign-up sheet, and we'll get the information out late October, actually October 13th through 16th. It's going to be great. But anyway, Rob McGorkle preached on this passage, and he suggested something that I'm, I'm still kind of mulling over in my mind and, and talking to God about. He said that it's not so much we all can do one or two things for God. It's that in any given moment, the, the Spirit of God who lives in us may like, come upon us and, and, and equip us and call us to give a word of encouragement or a word of knowledge or wisdom. Like, have you ever found yourself saying something that was way smarter than you to someone? It's like, where did that come from? And that's the Holy Spirit gifting you in a moment when, when you need it and when someone needs it. Maybe even the gift of healing. You know, I kind of said, let's, let's quit expecting the, the preacher just to, you know, do all the anointing and healing people. Maybe that gift will come upon you at some point. I think we need to be open to that. The gifts lists are typically found in these three passages. Romans 12 lists, you know, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, showing mercy. Some just very practical and earthy. And then you think prophecy, you know, I couldn't do that. But it's a word from the Lord. It's not like I can see the future. It's, you know, God has like given you a word that someone else needs from him. Corinthians, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, discernment, languages, interpretation. Romans, these are often referred to as the offices. And, and you could find other scripture passages. You know, they, they kind of talk about the, the supernatural or semi-supernatural kind of things that, that you're supposed to be doing. It's not just my job to do all of these. That's not God's plan. It's everyone... You know, we need the eyes and the ears and the armpits. <laughs> that was reference from my Facebook post. To get the job done. And, and that's the way God has designed it. Together, we have what we need to be the church here on 42nd Street, the, the missional force in this community. You're needed, you are gifted, you are called. There was a time not too long ago in church history 
when the clergy, the pastors, the priests had this attitude that, you know, we're the, we're the spiritual giants around here. You know, you have no right to even read this book, let alone, you know, share it with others. You know, they, they felt entitled and, and like it was an exclusive club. Well, if you know your history, I doubt they teach it in school anymore. But you know what happened in 1517? Old Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel and said, no, 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 that's not the way it is. He said, we're, salva- we're saved by grace alone, and the word of God is the authority. But the other tenet of the Protestant Reformation was the priesthood of all believers. You're priests, you know, entrusted with the message and, and the love of God. You know, I'm lucky. I get to make a living doing this thing. But, but you're all, you know, duly deputized to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We all have that calling and commission upon us. We're all to go into the world. We are all witnesses. No one's exempt who bears the name Christian. You you stoked? That's good news, right? Now I think there might be a special calling that we have to discern, we need to listen for. It's like Jason uh, at camp, at team camp. Lord kind of whispered to him. I don't know, he might have screamed in his ear. I got something that needs to be done, and you're the guy to do it. And he said, okay, I'm here. So he's, he's launching this ministry to the kind of the graduates, the transitional, what are you calling it again? Crossroads, great name. Our young people are at a crossroads in life as they make their faith their own, as they learn how to adult. It's not intuitive, right? <laughs> He said, I, I'm supposed to help them. You know, he, he's heard that from the Lord. And, and he probably said, I don't know if he said, most of us say, God, you got the right guy here. You know? But God never, hardly ever calls, you know, uber talented people, like obvious choices. He, he loves to use people who no one would suspect, you know. That's where he does his best work. When we... Say, I don't have much to offer, but, but here it is. Or, that scares me to death, but okay, Lord. Or, God, I'm busy. <laughs> I, just, I don't really have the time right now. I got other goals in life, and I'm needed here. There's a lot at stake in those moments. We'll get to that in a second. But don't wait until you hear the voice because you have this, you know, this commission, this deputation. And, you know, we, we would like to help you find your specific place, but I love it when people just say, All right, what needs to be done, Pastor? What can I do? And I think, I don't think they had spiritual gifts inventories in the early church. I think they just kind of started doing things. They probably prayed about it and, You know, someone said, I think you would be a good candidate to help serve meals to the widows. That was one of their needs in the early church. They said, well, I'll try. You're needed, you're gifted, you're called. One more pretty good reason to get off your keisters and get involved. You're better when you serve. In fact, you probably get more in return than you ever give. Can I get an amen? amen? Like, it's like when you start living on that edge of sanity, it's like, God, you want me to do this? Okay, and something happens in you. You grow. Service is an important means of grace. Here's the the common mentality. God, I got too many problems, too many issues. 
I'm not there yet. I'm not spiritual enough. You're never going to be spiritual enough. You know, it's like having kids. You're never ready to have kids. <laughs> I mean, ideally, you wait till you're married, but you know, you know what I'm saying. This is a means of grace. I, I, I've shared this story. I don't mean to embarrass them because they're not the only ones, but my in-laws, Tracy's parents, got saved and they were handed a Sunday school book, you know, start teaching kids. I don't know how quickly that happened, but it happened a lot in the olden days, and a lot of those saints are still in the church today. They're pillars of the church. And we'll give you a little more time than week two, but don't wait till you've been here 10 years to start saying yes. Because you're probably not going to become, you know, mature, grounded in the faith. Serving counteracts this kind of tendency we all have, even the spirit filled among you, <laughs> to put ourselves first. Because that's our default, you know? That's not real convenient. I got stuff I want to do. And that's not good. We, we've got a war against that, that attitude, that tendency. It's not of God, to not honor Christ. And again, I'm not saying that you should be serving every waking hour. You can take a few hours off. No. But again, I think, you know, when we start saying yes, God starts to change our character. We start to care more about other people. Maybe we're not feeling it, but things start to change. And some of these things, you know, may start to wane as well. I believe that serving is a great, you know, antidote to those who just are, you know, depressed all the time or don't feel like they have much to offer or, or tend to be critical, you know. Be a part of the solution. Join the team. Help your body do all that we're supposed to be doing to win, win, win. It, it honors God, it helps other people, and you will, will benefit. The best defense is a good offense. Does that mean anything to you? I think we're kind of seeing it in, in the NFL, college football. Like, to win games, you just got to score more points. You know, you got to Keep your foot on the pedal. Keep scoring more points. So what I mean spiritually, for those who keep struggling, it's like all you can do to hang in there spiritually. And, and you just don't seem to be, you know, growing. You're just trying to survive. Well, start giving of yourself to others for God's glory Start moving forward. Put your foot on the gas. See what you can do for the glory of God. And, and I don't think you'll ha have to worry about survival anymore. So let's start to be offensive, church. Let's get engaged in serving. It's vital to flourish as individual believers for our church to become what God wants us to be. to accomplish our mission. Man, we want to see this candle lit every week. And with 20% engaged in serving, we kind of get what we get. Maybe once every few months. There's a relationship between the number of volunteers and the decisions for Christ. One person at a time. That's, you know... Don't make me tell that starfish story. <laughs> it can make a difference for this one. And that's all God asks. Were you faithful in the little things? We are one body. There are no armpits here. You're, you're valuable. You're needed. 
You have something to offer. I don't care who you are. You have something to offer. We share one Lord. His name is Jesus. We have one spirit living within us, animating us, mobilizing us, empowering us. Experience one baptism, one cup. We have one mission. Go into all the world and make disciples. And one hope <laughs> that when Jesus comes again, he'll say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. Let's pray as we prepare for communion. God, I thank you <clears throat> for this great plan that you hatched before the foundations of the world to not only save us, but to enlist us in your army to be a part of the, the one thing that truly matters, this great mission to depopulate hell, God, to help precious people find life eternal and abundant. We can be a part of that, Lord. I think some are seeing that when they live with that expectancy, when, when they're looking for divine appointments, they happen and, and life gets, gets good, Lord. That's, that's what we're made for, to live lives of purpose and, and substance. Lord, I don't know why some people don't get involved, um, but they know the truth now, and God, the, the rest is up to them. But Lord, I pray that, that we as a church would, would unite together around the cause of Christ. We've got to be done with lesser things, with any kind of fussing and, and bickering. We have two, the work is too important. The stakes are too high. So unite us around this table and around Jesus as we remember his love and sacrifice, God. When, when we realize all that we've been forgiven from, we, we can't hold grudges. We can't hold each other at arm's length. So meet us at the table this day. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> the communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament, a, a visible word, which proclaims his life, his suffering, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. This supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. So all those who bear the name Christian are welcome to come. Come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and may be made one by the Spirit. I love this prayer they included. By your spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. So God, bless the elements, the morsel of bread, the sip of juice, and nourish us with them. Equip us for the work that you have for us to do, God. And, and may there be a lot of Yes is being said. Even maybe before what we're supposed to say yes to, we're, we're available, we're here, God. How can we not say yes in light of Jesus' broken body and shed blood? You loved us and we love you back by offering ourselves as living sacrifices. It's the only reasonable response. So God, bless the elements and all who partake and be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. So, most of you know how we do this. If you're unable to come forward, raise a hand, and Lucas will bring the elements to you. Um, we have gluten-free in the middle. 
But otherwise, follow the chart and file by the, the bread and the cup and receive them. And when everyone's been served, I'll give you instructions to take them together. Please come. Did you run out? Are you okay? He's okay. Do you need more? Do you need more? I need one for oh. me. body of Christ broken for you may it preserve you blameless under our lasting life. Let us eat this together. The blood of Christ shed for you. Drink this 
with a grateful heart for what Jesus has done. And watch this. Someone who is serving you or someone else and thank them for what they are doing. Essentially, our goal is that you call out the good in someone who usually the thing they're doing kind of goes unseen. A little example from my own life is I was at the Hy-Vee parking lot at 7 a.m. one day and I saw a young man out there sweeping the parking lot. And it reminded me of some of my high school jobs, in particular one where a manager asked me to go outside and sweep the parking lot. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing anyone has ever asked me to do. So seeing that, I decided I'd drive over and just let this person know, hey, thank you for doing what you're doing. I think you're a hard worker and you're doing a good job. And that's our, our goal. So if you wanna take it a step further, you can even take one of our little cards that we have and hand them out to people. And the card says something about you know, noticing someone doing something and thanking them for doing that. Anyway, so try to do this at least once this week, maybe more times if you want, and then come next Sunday prepared to share your experience with other people. Thank you and have a good rest of your Sunday. All right, so we're, uh, we're noticing the, the ways people are serving us. Um, I had a card somewhere. Did I bring it? I've lost my card, but there's a bunch of them over there in none of these pockets. It says something like, I noticed. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Um, so they're, they're at a table there. They're in the link. They're in the foyer. Pick up one or five but the, the real sign is just to let people know, as you see these gestures of, of kindness toward you, I, I think that will help us see how simple they can be, that, that a little gesture makes a big difference. But hand a card to someone, tip well, you know, that goes without saying. Would you stand and let me offer the blessing? Don't forget about our um, movie night at 6.30 right here. Because of that, the chairs will stay in place. Hope to see you tonight. So may the, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, may this God equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.